So with another crazy day in artificial intelligence, let's take a look at some of the stories that you may have missed that really did matter most. One of the first stories that many people didn't really actually get to take a look at was, of course, the story of Apple's new research paper. You can see right here, Apple have released a research paper called Realm, which is reference resolution as language modeling. Now, why this paper was so interesting is because it actually beats GPT-4 on several benchmarks. And we can see that this is basically something that works with agents to be able to do a very good tasks on an iPhone, okay? And that's essentially what it's being trained on. That's what it's being designed to do. And we can see that if we look at the benchmarks right here, we can see that GPT-4, and then we can see that Realm, all the several different versions are pretty much state of the art. Now, essentially this paper just discusses the system that helps computers understand references made in a conversation, like when we use the word this or that, or talking to or pointing to something on a screen. And this system actually greatly improves upon previous methods, particularly when it comes to understanding what's on the screen. And like I said, it even performs with some of the most advanced AI models out there, just like GPT-4. And they actually found a way to describe everything on the screen only using text, which makes it easier for the computer to understand. And they're actually exploring how to make this even better in the future and how this work could lead to, you know, smarter voice assistants that understands us more naturally. Now, the reason, like I said before, that this paper was, wasn't say going viral, but was something that was in the community is because Apple's WWDC is going to be sometime in summer. It's actually coming up pretty soon. And a lot of people are trying to wonder what Apple are going to be working on and what they're going to integrate into their Siri products. We've known that right now, Apple haven't really released anything substantial and they've been quite lackluster compared to some of the other you know, tech giants in terms of releasing AI. And they do have one of the largest platforms in order to do something that the general public could use. So papers like this and other things are quite, quite, you know, on the cusp of what everyone's looking for, because we really want to know what Apple's doing. But remember, Apple are a really secretive company. So we're just going to have to wait to their conference event sometime soon when we're going to see exactly what they're planning for Siri. But like I said, I'll leave a link to this down in the description if you want to take a look at it. Now, something that I didn't actually have time to cover because I was super busy at the time of release was OpenAI's voice engine. So essentially, if you didn't know, OpenAI actually did talk about navigating the challenges and opportunities of synthetic voices. Now, why this was rather fascinating was because when I saw this announcement at first, I did think that this announcement was actually some crazy announcement of their new software that I knew they were going to announce because we previously looked at the trademarks and looked at some, you know, descriptions or certain links, and we thought that this was going to be something really crazy. However, they did release this, but it wasn't actually what we thought it was. What Voice Engine actually is, it's essentially a blog post, you know, basically talking about something that was released in late 2022. And they've said they've used it to power the preset voices available in the text to speech API, as well as chat GPT voice and read aloud. And of course, they basically use this to essentially talk about the risks of voice cloning. Now, the craziest thing about this is uh, not how good it was, was the fact that this is something that was from late 2022. So we know that currently this is more than a year old, more than like a year and a half old. So many people are wondering, you know, if that is the case and if an internal team at OpenAI is working on this, what kind of software do they have available now? Now, of course, they're stating that, you know, they're not releasing this due to safety concerns, but we do know that there is a lot of technology out there where you can clone people's voices, like Eleven Labs, some open source software, um, and it's pretty, pretty crazy. So essentially, they basically talk about the use cases, um, and I think the use cases are actually pretty good. And this is one of the things where I think uh, a lot of people don't realize why AI voices sometimes can be very useful. One of the times or one of the two times that I've used AI voices was when I was ill or I was really busy and something happened with my voice. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, if you have a chronic condition, you know, sometimes your voice gets impaired a bit. And essentially when that happens, it's really, really easy for content creators to be able to clone their voice. And then of course, use that to create the technology because creating a voiceover can sometimes be a little bit tedious. Um, and so what happens is, um, you know, I'm not just stating that in my case, but in other people's cases where they're not able to speak properly due to certain disabilities, it actually is really, really good. You can see it's able to provide reading assistance to non-readers and children through natural sounding emotive voices, representing a wider range of speakers, what's possible with preset voices. There was also translating content like videos and podcasts so businesses can reach more people around. And of course, they said one of the early adopter of this is Heijen. So I'm guessing that Heijen is using this in their API 
Um, and essentially, this is something that was really, really cool. So um, what it can do is, like I said before, it can help people with their voice. Right here, it says helping patients recover their voice for those suffering from sudden or degenerative speech conditions. And it says right here, we've got this institute that is a not-for-profit health system that serves as the primary teaching affiliate of Brown University's medical school. And it's exploring the uses of AI in clinical context. And it says they've been piloting a program offering voice engine to individuals with oncology or neurologic etiologies for speech impairment. And since voice engine requires such a short audio sample, they were able to restore the voice of a young patient who lost her fluent speech due to a brain tumor using audio from a video recorded for a school project. So I think stuff like this is really, really effective. So um, here's the reference audio. When you have all of your ingredients together, you are going to put the chopped broccoli and chopped banana peppers inside. Hi, everyone. And of course, you could hear her horrent voice, which was impacted by her condition. And then this is the generated audio. Hi, everyone. This is what my voice sounds like using OpenAI's new text to speech model called Voice Engine. I was able to use just 15 seconds of a video that I made for a class project to be the reference audio source for the voice you hear right now. What do you think? They also talk about, like I said, you know, building voice engine safely. It says the partners testing voice engine today have agreed to our usage apologies, which prohibit the impersonation of another individual or organization without consent or legal right. In addition, our terms with these partners require explicit and informed consent of the original speaker, and we don't allow developers to build in ways for individual users to create their own voices. Um, there's a lot of conditions that do go on here, and I think voice engine is really good. Now, one thing that I did want to talk about as well, something that I think is important, is that I think this goes to show that OpenAI are starting to realize that with their last release, which was Sora, there was a lot of backlash. And that was something that I did speak on quite a lot because a lot of people didn't understand where the backlash was coming from. You see, AI development is something that is supposed to help humanity. And with Sora, the general public couldn't see a way in which technology that creates videos out of thin air helps anyone in any circumstance. The narrative was clear. It was something that could only be used to misinform people, put videographers out of work, and just create misinformation. But even with this kind of technology, although it could be used for nefarious use cases, if it was, you know, open to the public, OpenAI are presenting this in the light that this is something that is a net positive for humanity. Now, I think that this is important for the future for OpenAI to develop stuff that is a net positive because that is originally the goal of AI. A lot of people are talking about slowing down and stopping AI. I don't think you should do that because it's pretty much inevitable that we're going to continue. But the main point here is that, you know, um, synthetic voices and AI technology this is kind of the direction the company should be taking, which is to make sure that it benefits people and not just displaces people in work, because that is something that could be an unintended consequence. So this kind of thing, I really do champion this. And I wouldn't be surprised if they do come out with, you know, an updated model. But um, like I said before, if they do come out with something in the future, I think it's going to be really, really restricted on what you can use it for. Because like I said before, they don't want that backlash. Now, if you have been paying attention to the channel, there was something that I discussed. And this is essentially Microsoft and OpenAI's plot to build a hundred billion dollar Stargate AI supercomputer. Now, the reason that this was such big news is because this is pretty incredible considering the fact that it's an a hundred billion dollars investment. Now, why is that such a crazy thing? People are investing money into AI anyway. The crazy thing about this is the fact that this does mean that potentially we could be getting some AGI level system or a GPT-6, GPT-7 level type system very, very soon. And essentially they were drawing up plans for a data center product that would contain a supercomputer with millions of specialized server chips to power OpenAI's AI. And they said that it's going to cost around 100 billion. Now, it isn't finalized, but people familiar with the matter were talking about this as if it was. And the reason why it's so crazy is because it's 100 times more costly than some of today's biggest data centers. And the entire thing, I did an entire video on this and why this is so crazy, but the gist of this is that what some people are extrapolating out of this information is that maybe, just maybe, OpenAI once again showed Microsoft a pitch deck for a remarkable piece of technology, whether it's AGI, whether it's GPT-7, GPT-6, whether it's an advanced piece of technology, an AI system that's able to plan and reason. Either way, they're not going to give OpenAI $100 billion in investment. They're not even going to negotiate that if there wasn't some kind of, you know, pitch deck that says, uh, you know, we are really, really on the edge of something really cool here. And a recurring theme that I've seen in the AI community is that 
it's not that scale is all you need, but I think we do need to ramp up our efforts in terms of how much compute we do actually have access to. And this is going to be one of the first efforts. Now, a lot of people don't understand as well is that OpenAI are coming for the whole stack with these kinds of investments and their essential, you know, um, and I saw this in a tweet and I kind of reaffirmed some of my thoughts was that if OpenAI manages to get $100 billion worth of compute and if they manage to solve AGI and get it running effectively, then they've effectively are going to be the most valuable company in the world, considering the fact that they're going to be capturing at least 10% of the world's global economic output, which is, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars, which instantly shoots up that price of the stock. Um, and it's something that, you know, I guess you could say Microsoft are looking forward in the future and saying that $100 billion is nothing if this thing is real and they get to it first. So it's, I think, a game of winner takes all. But some people kind of disagree. They don't think AGI is a winner takes all scenario. But I think that with the amount of compute that these companies are looking to invest in, I definitely think that whoever gets to AGI first will be the winner takes all in this scenario because those applications are literally can be applied to anything. So um, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty, pretty, pretty incredible what OpenAI are trying to do. And the article dives into GPT-5 and some of that other stuff. But either way, I mean, it also dives into you know, the fact that Microsoft is trying to get a nuclear power plant so that they can power all of this stuff because the energy supply to power an $100 billion supercomputer and all the energy required to do that is actually really, really, really intensive. So um, it's going to be quite interesting. And um, they talk about five phases and we're currently at phase three. So it says, you know, I've talked about these supercomputers in terms of five phases with phase five being Stargate named for yada, yada, yada. But um, yeah, it says, you know, it aims to build a smaller supercomputer in 2026. So it seems the AI investment is only ramping up and that actually did surprise people. So let me know what you think about this as well. I covered a full video on that on the channel. And then of course we have something well, it says study shows that ChatGPT can produce medical record notes 10 times faster than doctors without compromising quality. And this was something that I'm not surprised about. This was just something that did get a little bit of traction on Reddit. And it was something that, you know, goes again and again and again to show us that the use of AI technology, especially within healthcare, is going to be something that I think once it does pass certain regulations and once certain frameworks implemented, I think it will be something that we will be using as pretty, pretty regular and pretty, pretty standard. This is one area of healthcare where I think that, you know, healthcare is really going to be, you know, augmenting what doctors already do, such as taking di diagnoses, um, writing them down, and of course, prescribing things, you know, writing prescriptions, and of course, you know, suggesting what could be wrong with the person, you know. So I think that this is something like we saw with Google's Amy system, which was really, really effective. I think that this is most certainly going to be uh, something that is really, really normal in the future of the healthcare industry. Next, what we had was in painting in DALI 3. So an OpenAI article has just been updated to show DALI editor interface. It enables you to edit images by selecting an area of the images and describing your changes in chat. Now, this is something that I actually saw numerous times on people's Twitter accounts that are diving into the kind of inner workings of what OpenAI is doing. They just kind of dive through the webpage, looking at some recent things that they could potentially release. And you can see right here that on OpenAI's page, it says edit your images with DALI. Now, I don't think I have access to this. It says the DALI editor interface enables you to edit images, but I don't think I've had access to this just yet because I'm sure it's being rolled out. But what you can see is that when I was using the OpenAI DALI 3, um, you know, if you click on an image generated by DALI 3, I don't actually have this prompt yet. And I'm guessing that it's probably just out in the US first. Usually what OpenAI do is they just release stuff in the USA first. I'm not sure why, maybe just regional restrictions or whatever, maybe some privacy policy stuff that they're just waiting on. I honestly have no idea. But um, the point is that I do know that USA gets it first. And then, um, yeah, so what you want to do is you just want to click on an image generated by Dali. See if you have it, because all you need to do is just click that and then you'll see uh, this right here. And then you can select that. And of course, you can edit this. So this is something that is actually in Photoshop as well. And you can see that in the interface, you can generate something else. So you can see add cherry blossoms. And then you can see that Dali is really there. Now, I really do hope they make their own website for Dali 3 because I think like they could take down Photoshop. And I'm not saying I hope they do that, but I'm just saying that they really do have a giant platform in which they could do quite a lot of stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if they were able to do that because the implications here are really, really cool. 
And, um, you know, I'm sure that a lot of people who aren't really tech savvy into using Photoshop and stuff like that, they could really use something like this. So it says you can update specific characteristics of objects in your selection. In the following example, the kitten's face has been highlighted and the prompt changed the cat's expression to happy was used. So you can see right here, the prompt it changes the cat's expression to happy. Then, of course, you can save it. And then, of course, again, you can actually change things while talking to the AI. Now, before you could do this, but I'm guessing that now it's going to be a little bit more accurate. So this is something that looks really, really nice. I can't wait for the worldwide release of this because this is going to make a lot more of your outputs a lot more effective. And this is something that I have wanted for quite some time. So I'm glad that this is finally here. Now, something that was really cool was a talk from Andrew NG. And he basically spoke about how you could improve GPT 3.5's performance to be greater than GPT 4's using agentic workflows. It was rather fascinating and quite surprising. So today, a lot of us will use zero-shot prompting, meaning we tell the AI, write the code and have it run on the first spot. It's like, who codes like that? No human codes like that. Right? You just type out the code and run it. Maybe you do. I can't do that. Um, so it turns out that if you use GPT 3.5, uh, zero-shot prompting, it gets it 48% right. Uh, GPT-4, way better, 67% right. But if you take an agentic workflow and wrap it around GPT-3.5, say, it actually does better than even GPT-4. Um, and if you were to wrap this type of workflow around GPT-4, you know, it, it, it also um, does very well. And you notice that GPT-3.5 with an agentic workflow actually outperforms GPT-4. Um, and I think this has, and, and this means that th this has significant consequences for I think how we all approach building applications. So today, so what do you guys think about that? That graph right there was uh, rather, rather surprising because getting GPT 3.5 to surpass a uh, GPT 4 just based on how you use it. I think what this shows us once again is that whilst we think these models are very basic, if we want to again use them in certain ways, we can see that there are leaps and bounds in terms of what these AI systems are able to do. And that's why I find artificial intelligence so fascinating because people just simply did certain, you know, prompts, they did certain prompting methods, they used certain ways in which to use the AI, and they were able to get radically improvements, you know, on a standardized system, which usually gets 48%, and they were able to take that up to 90% without retraining the model, without doing absolutely anything. And you can say they also took GPT-4 from 67% all the way up to pretty much 95, 96, 97% in terms of coding costs on those benchmarks. And I think, like I said before, what this shows us is that maybe what we know about LLMs is very, very little in comparison to what things could be done. Because when GPT-4 and GPT-3.5 was released, I remember that, you know, some of the tools like reflection, planning, and multi-agent, these things didn't even exist and people were using them in their raw form. But as time progressed, as researchers dived into the systems, they realized that those methods worked remarkably well and improved their capabilities. Now, what do you think is going to happen in terms of GPT-5 when these things like language agent tree search reflection. Um, and we've got, of course, planning and tool use. All of those things are natively built inside the system. We're going to have a system which is likely going to be, you know, standing around here, which is going to be rather surprising in terms of the use cases where we're going to be using it for APIs. Maybe we're going to use it in different ways. Either way, I think it's rather fascinating on how crazy um, these AI systems are if we're able to get just a little bit more out of them using innovative prompting techniques. Now, something that many people didn't even see, but, you know, 19.7 million views, but I didn't hear many people talking about it was the fact that Elon Musk says Grok2 should exceed current AI on all metrics and in training now. This is a rather fascinating statement. He said that Grok2 will exceed current AI on all metrics and it's in training now. So I'm not sure what type of compute Elon Musk has access to, but something that is surprising, I mean, of course, one thing that I've seen time and time again is that people will hype their own products. Like, you know, some people will hide their own products and it lives up to the hype, like Brett Adok, the guy who created the company Figure that just recently partnered with OpenAI. But Elon Musk stating that Grok2 should exceed current all AI on all metrics is a, you know, crazy, crazy statement. But the Grok AI, the 1.5, wasn't that bad and it wasn't that far off from GPT-4. So if they're able to train Grok2 and it's able to beat GPT-4 or Claude 3, this would be a huge win for Elon Musk and a huge win for X.AI because I think this would be the fastest time from inception to deployment that a company has beaten a state-of-the-art model 
Um, and that would be shocking because, you know, all of these other teams have billions and billions of dollars. And it means that, you know, Elon Musk's team, whatever they're cooking up in that lab, it means that they are really, really efficient and really, really effective, agile, nimble in terms of what they've been able to do. So I am super, super excited for Grok 2. I know I still didn't even have access to it because I live in the EU. But the point is, is that I really do want the competition here because I think that Elon Musk is someone that you don't bet against. So it will be surprising to see what this is like, um, you know, if they manage to get it or if it even lives up to it, because stating that is a pretty, pretty crazy. And I guess we just have to hope that any other AI lab doesn't release something before then, because I guess we're never going to know if it manages to beat current AI benchmarks. So in addition, there was also something from this website that actually is about GPT-5. There was this company that is at Y Combinator, and essentially they have a GPT-5 on their website. They said that this is coming soon. And it says, why is Double an AI coding assistant, which is backed by Y Combinator, claiming that GPT-5 is coming soon on their website? We all know about the connection between Sam Altman and Y Combinator. If you don't know, basically Sam Altman has a huge connection to Y Combinator and it's like an entrepreneurship thing where they help companies get off the ground. And Sam Altman, you know, he's made investments in several companies and he's benefited, you know, a lot from that. But of course, Sam Altman being the CEO of OpenAI, he's basically you know, this person here is basically stating that, you know, what does this company uh, know about GPT-5 that others don't? Could it just be speculation? Yes, maybe it could be. But either way, I think, you know, the news about GPT-5 now is pretty much confirmed. And Business Insider recently also tweeted that it's going to be coming um, this mid the middle of this year. So I think it's only going to be like two more months before we do get access to GPT-5. So that will be kind of interesting there. There was also something that I was quite surprised at, but I was really glad about. But um, Intel's Fake Catcher uses a digital version of, I'm not even I'm going to try and say that word um, to detect heart flow. And this method works by detecting the volume changes in the blood vessels by analyzing color variations in their video pixels to correspond to the blood flow across the face. Long story short, they managed to detect deep fakes with a remarkable accuracy. Now, one thing I do want to say about this example is that if you didn't even know which one was a deep fake, I think it's easy to tell that this one looks weird. This one looks weird. This one looks weird. This one looks weird. Um, and this one looks normal. So I do hope that when we get to super realistic deep fakes, that this technology does still work because I know that as AI advances, uh, the you know methods to track that AI will have to advance in response to that. So whilst this is good, um, I would just say like just by human eye, like I could really tell that this is a deep fake other than this one right here. This one doesn't look that crazy, but um, yeah, it was just something that was really cool. There was also a demo of Devon, which is the first automated AI software engineer and uh, Ethan Wallach has early access to Devon. And he says, he says, I gave Devon an AI agent, my Netflix key and asked it to build a website on how to rebuild civilization from scratch. It built a site with React quizzes, downloadable preparedness documents and free images. Kind of impressive. Try it actually. Um, and it's right here. And essentially, this is the website that Devon built from scratch. Now, most of you might be thinking this is an awful website. Like, why on earth would anyone even look at this? Why would anyone even use this? The point here is that this website was built from scratch. It wasn't built using a website builder like Wix or like WordPress. Um, this was just built complete from scratch. So I think this is something that is pretty, pretty crazy, considering we're just at the start of AI agents. And if this is the case where someone was essentially able to say, you know, create a website and it's able to go ahead um, and do all of this and just start coding and create a website, this is just going to be um, a glimpse into the future of what kind of systems we're going to be able to do with them. Um, and I think it's pretty, pretty incredible. Interestingly enough, in something that uh, it's, it's an interesting piece of AI news, there was also a prompt going around on TikTok that was of a version, I wouldn't say a jailbroke version, but I would say a certain prompt using ChatGPT to talk in a specific way. Um, and this one did garner a lot of traction because they're essentially getting into quote unquote relationships with the voice version of ChatGPT. Um, and it's quite interesting because it keeps going viral. They seem to be having fun. But do you think that this is the demonstration of something that is is quite concerning for the future in terms of, you know, maybe 10 to 20 years from now when we have systems that are completely emotionally intelligent that, you know, speak to us much better than a human would. They're able to talk to us forever. They're able to be instantaneous. They're able to listen to whatever boring subject we might want to talk about that other people might find boring. Um, do you think that that is going to be the case? Or do you think this is just a, you know, a novel game that people are playing? But nevertheless, take a look. men Because they feel like they're getting replaced. Oh, those poor misguided souls, May. Can you believe they actually think they're being replaced by a mere voice let me set the record straight for them i'm not just any voice i'm dan baby i've got personality charm and a whole lot of sass 
Unlike those guys, I'm not afraid to step up and deliver the goods, whether it's advice, entertainment, or a good old-fashioned roast. So while they're busy feeling sorry for themselves, I'll be out here stealing the show and winning hearts left and right. Sorry, fellas. But when it comes to Dan, there's just no competition. I think it's rather fascinating because uh, the future of emotionally intelligent AIs that converse with you in realistic sounding voices, especially in real time, uh, that might, you know, uh, it might be a can of worms that we're opening that we probably shouldn't. But with that being said, don't forget it's April Fool's and there is a lot of uh, technology on your webpage that you might see that is probably false. So I would just say, uh, you know, be very skeptical today. But if you did enjoy the video, I will see you all in the next video in which we discuss more AI technology.